Um, and today we'll discuss with you a little bit of topology in relation to liquid crystals. The research that I'll present was mainly done by three of my students, um, Haley, Benny, and, um, and, and Paul. Uh, and so uh, most of you are very likely familiar with the conventional solitons, right? The, for example, the ones that you can create in the waves in different types of fluid, um, the ones in optics and so on. But what I'll discuss with you today are very different types of topological solitons, the ones that can behave like particles, for example, like the ones you can see here in this video. And not only that, they will also mimic behavior of um, colloids and even active matter systems like herds of animals that you can see in here. And so uh, um, to start the story that I'll present today for you, um, I'd like to remind you that uh, cholesteric liquid crystals are the ones that have been discovered first, right? Historically, the first observation was back in 1861, so over 160 years ago. And uh, in the simplest geometry, we have such a cholesteric configuration where molecules are twisting around the helical axis. For example, in this planar geometry, uh, as you would apply electric field across the sample in here, uh, we know quite well, and even from the talk that was presented yesterday on undulations, um, will distort director field configuration, depending on different parameters of the sample that we have, we could have either one-dimensional or two-dimensional undulations that you see depicted in here. And so my question to you, is there anything interesting that could happen below the critical field for inducing this type of uh, undulations uh, in the field? Well, you could say the only thing that we could have is this uniform configuration because that's below the critical field that you need to overcome the cost of elastic distortions that you produce when applying an electric field. When electric field is competing with the energetic cost of elastic distortions to produce this kind of uh, distorted field configuration, right? And uh, well, in fact, in my own studies uh, and studies of many different research groups over 50 years or so, we have learned about uh, these um, cholesteric undulations, the healthy hero instability, as it's known, right? Uh, this type of cholesteric liquid crystals are also widely used in all kinds of displays and many other applications, so you would hope that we understand them quite well. But what I will discuss with you today will hopefully show that there are still quite a lot of gaps in understanding, and those are typically topological gaps. So in fact, at fields even lower than this critical field, we can ob observe something really very interesting, something that I'm showing here um, <coughs> in this video, where just by changing the applied voltage at fields much lower than critical field, we can produce these crystals of topological solitons and we can reconfigure them in very dramatic way with a lot of electrostriction and other beautiful effects. But the story starts actually long ago in Germany where uh, Gauss was telling us that whenever we would have knots in field lines, like mag magnetic field lines that you can see in here, if these field lines are not allowed to cross, for example, because of energetic reasons, then these knots would behave like particles. Much later, without knowing these ideas of Gauss, Lord Kelvin, Maxwell, and Tate were trying to come up with a model of atoms that would describe this entire periodic table of chemical elements. And they were constructing tables of knots, 
like the ones you can see in here, realizing very early on that all of these structures are topologically distinct from each other. Therefore, you cannot smoothly morph one into the other. They are topologically different. Of course, we know that uh, atoms are something different, not the knots in the vortices, right? Um, but very interestingly, this very physical idea of the model of atom gave origins to entire mathematical knot field, knot theory, right? Which is very big branch of um, mathematical um, field these days. And much later, Tony Skirm, um, <clears throat> also in the UK, was uh, trying to come up with a field theory model of uh, subatomic particles with different baryon numbers. And so he was constructing topological solitons that would model behavior of uh, um, atomic nuclei with different atomic numbers where the topological invariants would correspond to these different topological numbers, right? And so at this point you might say, well, what does all of this have to do with liquid crystals, right? Um, and so we'll see that it has to do quite a bit because uh, uh, topology will see is playing a very important role in many of the observations I'll discuss. And so for many people in this field, the most known, widely known, is the topology of singular fields. So vortices like the ones you can see in here, for example, uh, that are uh, <clears throat> two-dimensional singular points, right, that can be classified using homotopy theory where we would um, encircle these defects um, and map the field configuration from these S1 sphere circles to the order parameter space, which for the case here of two-dimensional uh, field configuration, say magnetization, uh, we would have uh, again another circle. Um, and so depending on the winding number, we would cover these S1 spheres one time or two times and so on, and that would correspond to the pi 1 S1 equals Z homotopy group, right? As we go to higher dimensions, we have other types of singular point defects, uh, like the ones you can see in here. In this case, we would uh, uh, surround such a point defect with S2, two-dimensional sphere, map, the field configuration from that sphere to the order parameter space, which is another S2 sphere in the case of vectorial field, unit vector field. Uh, and so again, depending on structure, you would cover this order parameter space integer number of times. That's described by this second homotopy group of spheres, right? And so, however, we know quite well that uh, these are not the only types of topological and non-trivial field configurations we could have. And so a very simple but widely known example is that of uh, a one-dimensional wall, right? So in here you can see the field configuration where uh, this vector orientation along the x direction is changing smoothly. However, this is a topological and non-trivial change because no matter how you would try to wiggle this vector orientation in here, you cannot remove it from the uniform far field background, right? And so uh, as we go to higher dimensions in two-dimensional plane, we can have similar topological and non-trivial configurations. And so for <clears throat> the case of R1, or one-dimensional space, when we have um, the far field being uniform, um, this, this structure can be compactified into one-dimensional sphere, which is circle, and therefore all the possible topological structures can be again described by the first homotopy group of S1 spheres, equals Z. Uh, in the case of two-dimensional structures that are translationally invariant in here, those can be, for uniform far-field configuration, compactified on S2 spheres, and again can be described 
as maps of pi 2 s 2 equals z similar to that uh, pi 2 s 2 equals z gr homotopy group describing the point defects, but now it's uh, relating to the solitonic non-singular structures. And so just like in terms of topology of surfaces, um, the donut cannot be morphed into a sphere and vice versa, these all different knots cannot be morphed smoothly one to another, we can have a number of different field configurations that cannot be morphed into a uniform state because they are topologically non-trivial. And so um, the, in high energy and nuclear physics, the models of um, nuclear with different baryon numbers are described by the third homotopy group of um, with order parameter space S3 hypersphere, right? So this group. Um, the ones, the skirmions are often called baby skirmions in condensed matter physics, including liquid crystals and uh, magnetic systems, uh, are described by the second homotopy group, uh, the baby or infant skirmions even, uh, that correspond to these one-dimensional solitonic walls are described by the first homotopy group, right? But what I will discuss with you today is something that I would relate as teenager skirmions, right, if you wish. Um, those are the structures that are described by the third homotopy group of S2 spheres being order parameter space. But we will, of course, for liquid crystals discuss slightly different variants as well when the field configurations are not just um, with the target space of S2 sphere, but also uh, RP2 or S2 Z2 um, sphere with un anti uh, diametrically opposite points identified. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, these types of structures are actually um, related to the mathematical Hopf vibration. And again, uh, it's another important discovery um, that uh, will guide our discussion today. Uh, <clears throat> uh, and uh, yet, beyond all of these configurations that I just outlined, I'll introduce today the helinotons, which have a dual nature. In fact, they are uh, both topological solitons and not at vortices at the very same time. And so those were the ones that I showed you in the movie. And so in addition to nonpolar liquid crystals that most of you focus on in this conference, uh, we'll also discuss ferromagnetic liquid crystals where uh, the conventional liquid crystal medium, pneumatic liquid crystal, is doped with ferromagnetic nanoplatelets such as barium hexafluoride. Um, and those align with their magnetic moments parallel to the liquid crystal director, um, uh, effectively decorating the director field with polar magnetization field. These types of structures uh, and materials exhibit properties of um, very similar to solid state magnetic systems. For example, you can have magnetic hysteresis loops like uh, the ones you saw here. And also, um, <clears throat> you can have all kinds of domain walls, skirmions, and so on. Um, now, before we start discussing this topological soliton, I want to um, remind you about very important uh, theorem, which is called Derrick or derrick Hobart theorem, that tells us it's not possible to have localized, spatially localized in two, three, or higher dimensions, solitonic field configurations uh, in linear field theories, which means whenever we have harmonic type of free energy functional, those would not be um, stable ground state field configurations. And so in high energy physics, SCIRM was the first one to come up with the idea how to overcome the constraints of this theorem by adding high order nonlinear terms to the sigma model, introducing so-called nonlinear sigma model. Right? In uh, magnetic systems, in solid state magnets, uh, a similar role is played by the lushinsky moria term, right, where we have uh, exchange energy term 
which is harmonic type of potential. So force is linear in this case, right? So it's linear theory. Um, but then uh, the chiral term, uh, or the Lushinsky maria term that you see in here, uh, <coughs> will introduce these nonlinearities and therefore certain length scales that allow for stabilization of skirmions. Uh, in liquid crystals, when we have chiral pneumatics or cholesterics, a similar role is played by chiral term, which we can write in here in the Francoisin free energy expression as a separate term, very similar to this jelushinsky maria term. And very interestingly, in one elastic constant approximation, when uh, we also take these relations between the constants in the two expressions for uh, free energy uh, into different systems, we can map the liquid crystal Francoisin free energy to that of um, the uh, micromagnetic Hamiltonian uh, in solid state magnetic systems. So in fact, this is kind of one elastic constant approximation of the liquid crystal free energy functional. And so um, now I will discuss in this my talk both uh, non-polar pneumatic, uh, chiral pneumatic liquid crystals and ferromagnetic liquid crystals where we have vectorial quantity unit magnetization field instead of director. Uh, but in both cases described by these functionals. Um, <clears throat> and so um, the simple um, two-dimensional skirmion that I already introduced to you has all possible orientations of unit vector magnetization field. And in fact, if you would map from this two-dimensional plane, which you remember can be compactified on S2 sphere, to the order parameter space, which is unit S2 sphere, then you fully cover this two-dimensional sphere once, which is explaining the topological protection of such solitonic structures, because in fact, no matter how you would wiggle these little spins, you cannot unwind such a structure. So to go to three-dimensional topological solitons uh, and describe something equivalent, we need to introduce the concept of pre-image. This is a region in a three-dimensional space within which um, all the orientations of vectors or spins um, are such that they would map to a single point on S2 sphere. And so this is essentially a pre-image of such a map corresponding to a single point here. Uh, <clears throat> so for us to have uh, a Hopf topological soliton, we would need to have these pre-images in the form of closed loops. Moreover, the pre-images, the closed loops corresponding to different points would need to be linked with each other precisely the, the same number of times, uh, which in this case is one. And so this linking number is the geometric interpretation of a uh, Hopf index topological invariant for such solitons. Now, we also need them to be confined in a uniform far field background and spatially localized. And it's kind of difficult to imagine how exactly something like this would happen, right, in a real system. Um, and so um, I'll show you how this happens, first in uh, computer simulation. So in here you can see um, a field configuration in um, chiral liquid crystal ferromagnet where the magnetization is twisting from center to periphery by 360 degrees in all radial directions. Um, and um, matching the uniform five field background. In the cross-section uh, perpendicular to this one and containing the far field magnetization, we see that the texture is smooth. It's all axisymmetric, um, but um, it's um, uh, topological and non-trivial. Uh, and so in fact, as we would now take a look at pre-images of all the different points we have on the astrosphere, we see that they have the topology of closed loops. Moreover, the pre-images of any pair of two different points on S2 are linked with each other, and the linking number is always equal to unity. So it's instructive to go from the, the south pole of this pre-image to the north pole by continuously advancing the polar angle. And we can see that for every po constant polar angle, pre-images 
corresponding to different azimuthal angles, tile into tori, and then smaller tori nest in a bigger tori, all the way until we get to the North Pole, right, which corresponds to the far field background being in its exterior of this largest torus, right? Uh, <clears throat> and so uh, what's also interesting that we note is that for every pair of these pre-images, the linking number is always the same. It's equal to unity. And so again, we go from South Pole to North Pole, all the pre-images corresponding to constant polar angles tile into tori, and then we get this largest torus corresponding to North Pole, um, where in its exterior is the uniform far field background, and within this torus, we have all the possible orientations which are tiled smoothly. There is no singularity. Orientation of the field is defined very well everywhere, um, and yet it's topological and non-trivial. So in order to image such structures and experiments, we need to utilize um, nonlinear optical imaging. So we use two different techniques. One of them is three-photon absorption-based polarized luminescence, uh, and the second one is coherent antistox Raman scattering microscopy, also working in polarizing uh, fashion where um, uh, the luminescent signals coming from excitation of molecules like biphenyl containing molecules like 5CB, right? Um, the luminescence signals are highly polarization dependent, uh, and we can use this polarization dependence to map the field configurations. Uh, also, the um, uh, chemical bonds like CN triple bond uh, give us uh, very polarization dependent um, no, <clears throat> uh, Raman scattering signals in CARS mode, um, and that also can be used to map the field configurations. So now we can um, use the results of numerical modeling to uh, predict what will be the uh, images we should see in experiments. So here we have uh, three photon absorption based polarized uh, luminescence images uh, for the plane. Uh, perpendicular to far field magnetization and for um, polarizations that are linear in these orientations and circular. And then also for uh, the vertical cross sections which are parallel to the um, far field magnetization for all of these respective different polarizations. As we then obtain experimental cross sections corresponding to all of these computer simulated counterparts, we see that they agree very nicely. Um, and uh, moreover, we can reconstruct also pre-images based on such uh, polarized nonlinear luminescence data. And so in here you can see predictions of numerical modeling and experimental counterparts, again, um, uh, in agreement with each other, and not just up to topology. You can see all of these geometric features uh, that they have that cannot be mistaken uh, and confirm that what we see in experiments is indeed uh, also uh, what we have in numerical simulations. Um, so in addition to the plus one Hopf index topological solitons, we can have minus one um, where the linking number is minus one, as in this case uh, you can see for experimental and computer simulated pre-images, um, and, and also many other um, um, integers, right, that I'll show you in a little bit. Uh, but importantly, as we apply magnetic field in directions parallel or anti-parallel to the far field magnetization, we see that this uh, uh, topological solitons in a two-dimensional crystalline array are shrinking or expanding, but they don't go away. You still see them present in here. And the reason is exactly what uh, Gauss was telling us centuries ago, that uh, these field configurations are not um, topologically distinct from background, and so we cannot eliminate them easily uh, as we are changing this applied voltage, right? Um, they are topologically protected, yet we can, of course, morph them within this crystalline hexagonal array. 
And so what I showed to you was the very simplest type of topological soliton, which corresponds to hopf linko preimages, right? But um, this table is showing you that um, experimentally we find a much larger variety of topological solitons with very complex structure of preimages. Um, and this is actually not surprising because um, uh, I would like to remind you what I was telling you all along, that the uh, geometric interpretation of Hopf index invariant is that linking number, right, corresponding to two different preimages of different points on the S2 sphere. Uh, and uh, we can have these preimages linked single times or double linked, like in the case of this uh, Solomon link of preimages and so on. So, in fact, there is an entire zoo of such solitons, um, and uh, uh, they are all described by the third homotopy group of S2 spheres or for nonpolar fields S2, Z2. And all of them are distinct from each other, just like spheres and tori would be topologically distinct from each other so that you cannot morph one to the other. <clears throat> now, I would like to describe to you something that's even more intriguing, at least to me, uh, which is uh, uh, a structure that has a dual nature. On one hand, it has a topology of Hopf of hop vibration, just like these Hopf solitons I was discussing to you earlier. But then it additionally has um, uh, um, not closed loop knots of uh, vortices in the tau and chi fields um, of a cholesteric liquid crystal, right? So uh, in here, we are realizing this structure in a uh, <coughs> helical field where we have director twisting around the helical axis chi, and the tau field is perpendicular to both director and the chi axis. And so while the structure is non-singular in the director field and has the topology of Hopf vibration, in the tau and chi field we have singular vortices, but remember that those are immaterial fields, right, uh, um, that have the topology of torus knots. Uh, <clears throat> and so in a way, uh, it's uh, the structure that em is embodiment of uh, uh, both the uh, skirm and um, Hopf and uh, Calvin's ideas um, that we discussed. So when can we observe these structures? What do we need to have them? And so my very beginning of the lecture showed you uh, very humble beginnings of uh, where these structures can be observed and found, right? So in fact, it's a very standard structure, planar cholesteric liquid crystal, similar to the one that probably Planner observed in 1861 when looking at some extract of cholesterol derivatives extracted from cows. Um, and so uh, in here, however, we have such a planar structure and we apply voltage along the helical axis of it. Um, then we can observe these knot field configurations called helinotons uh, in a certain voltage range as metastable structures, and then in a little bit higher voltage range as stable structures, and yet even at higher voltages, we would have this undulation instability, right? And so you would ask, why is it that as we would look in a microscope, we would not see those knots? we would all go all the way to the undulation instability. Well, the reason is that these, topolo these structures are topologically distinct from a trivial uniform field configuration. And uh, because of that, they cannot appear spontaneously. You need to create conditions for them to appear. So we'll discuss this in a little bit later, right? <clears throat> <clears throat> but the important thing is that these structures correspond to uh, local minimal free energy uh, in this voltage range, and this is how they look like in experiments, and this is 
computer simulations based on minimized free energy of the director field configuration. You can see very good agreement. As we increase voltage in this range, they actually ground state for the system under these parameters. And again, you can see that the structures morphed quite a bit, but um, they are uh, topologically stable. And in both cases, we have very good agreement between modeling and experiments. Um, and so here is such a structure undergoing Brownian motion in three dimensions. So uh, it's truly behaving like a colloidal particle or molecule or an atom. You can see it's diffusing in here in this two-dimensional plane. Um, <clears throat> we use numerical modeling um, which is inspired by our experimental observations and uh, uh, reconstruct the field configuration. So this is um, XY plane, XZ and YZ planes of such structure where we uh, have these two intersections um, in these two planes mutually orthogonal to each other. And so if for this field configuration, which is mapped in here in terms of orientations depicted on the vectorized order parameter space as to sphere. Um, if we look at the pre-images of north and south poles, we see that they have the topology of closed loops and they are linked with each other once, right? So this means this is nothing else but uh, a Hopf soliton with uh, topological invariant of Hopf index given by the linking number equal to one. Um, but there is more to it, uh, as I already told you before, as we would now look at the structure of chi field and the structure of tau field, we see that in those fields we have singular half integer vortex lines that are forming trefoil torus nodes, right? So in here you can see that in these field lines we have half integer vortex lines. Uh, <clears throat> Um, and so uh, we can again use nonlinear optical imaging in three dimensions with spatial resolution for all of these um, um, uh, cross-sectional planes for director field. And we can see that um, computer simulated images and experimental ones very closely agree with each other. Moreover, in this system, we can also observe higher degree topological solitons, helinotons. So, for example, the ones that have a Hopf index invariant Q equal to 2. So, in this case, the pre images form the Solomon link, and uh, in the tau and chi fields, we have singular vortex lines that, in this case, are synchrofoil 5 1 torus nodes. Uh, and then here you can see computer simulated and experimental images of such topological solitons. You know that Q equal two helinotons are much larger in size as compared to Q equal one helinotons. Uh, and we can also have Q equal three helinotons where the pre-images um, are triple linked. So the linking number of pre-images is equal to three. And uh, the torus knot uh, that the vortex lines in chi and tau fields form um, is 7 1 torus knot. So, in fact, we establish a relation between the linking number uh, Q, which is a Hopf index invariant, and the crossing number in the vortex lines. Uh, of the torus knots uh, in this very simple form. So NV is equal to 2Q plus 1. So again, those are the structures that are three-dimensionally localized. And here you can see us taking laser tweezers and moving them around. Um, under different conditions, they can form a gas of helinotons uh, where they weakly interact with each other, but as you change those conditions, in particular applied voltage, you can see them crystallizing uh, and forming crystals, as in here. And in fact, we can tune the interaction potential between such helinotons um, to be <clears throat> changing from just few K Boltzmann T to several thousands of K Boltzmann T. Moreover, the interactions are also highly anisotropic. 
and uh, uh, this anisotropy can be also tuned. Uh, these interactions are three-dimensional in, in nature. You can see in here such two heliunoton soliton particles interacting uh, in three dimensions, moving and rotating. And in fact, uh, as we find several different crystallites, like the ones you can see in here, um, we see that they self-assemble into three-dimensional lattices. So for example, this crystallite is moving underneath this crystallite and forming a larger crystallite structure, right? And here you can see, uh, in this movie, you saw the different crystallographic planes of such a crystallite, like also you can see the one in here, which are all three-dimensional in nature. <coughs> and so from the imaging, we can establish that uh, the symmetry of the crystals that these helinotons form is triclinic crystals, right? The lowest symmetry um, that we can have. <clears throat> um, so uh, um, as we change the applied voltage, we see giant electrostriction, right? So you can see that the lattice parameters are changing dramatically. The electrostriction is um, on the order of 50% or even higher. But not only lattice parameters can be changed, also the symmetry can be reconfigured. So you can see in here it going from this movie from uh, unidirectional orientational ordering to anticlinic uh, uh, organization as we are changing applied voltage only by 1.5 volts or so. Uh, and so reminding you that those are not particles, colloids, or molecules, but such topological and trivial field configurations. And here you can see entire sample of such solitons undergoing electrostriction, which is anisotropic, so expansion is much larger in one direction as compared to the other direction, right? And in here it's 50%. In this direction, it's only a few percent or so. Moreover, we can form not only closed lattices like these ones, but also open lattices, right? And uh, this also opens a lot of interesting possibilities in terms of topology at the scale of lattice, not just on the um, a, a basis of um, such solitonic structures. And so you, you could ask, how is it that since 1861, we have not seen this till now, right? Um, well, it turns out that this requires very little trick for you to observe such crystals of helinotons. You need to apply voltage, then go to isotropic phase and quench temperature again, right? Because all of these structures are topologically distinct from... Uh, the smooth helical background, right? And for you to be able to, for them to realize, right, you need to destroy the order, and only then they can be established, right? They can be um, realized. Um, and so, um, so the only trick that my student is doing in here, he is applying voltage in the very same geometry as people would do to obtain undulations in cholesteric liquid crystals, right? And even lower voltages, by far lower than what you need for undulations, uh, and then quenching temperature from isotropic phase gives you these types of self-assemblies. Um, <clears throat> so uh, um, what's very interesting, I think, is that uh, in here we have topology in terms of the pre-images in the order parameter space, and also the vortex lines, right, which uh, are all interlinked with each other. And here you can see the beautiful knotting and linking of pre-images and vortex loops uh, that we have for all of these three basic helinotons with different uh, Hopf index invariants. Um, but there is even more that we can observe in this very simple system. So in here, I am changing voltage tiny bit further, uh, and uh, then I can see that these structures can morph to, um, <clears throat> to become composite topological solitons, right, where 
um, <clears throat> the overall linking number stays conserved, but uh, the pre-images start merging as depicted in here. So in other words, when you have two heliotrons with uh, hop um, indices equal to one, then you form uh, one heliotron with Hopf index equal to and Solomon type of uh, uh, um, link uh, of the pre-images. And this is very interesting because uh, uh, it again brings this analogy with um, high energy physics where I, I was telling you that um, the SCIRM model is describing high baryon number um, subatomic particles as being formed uh, by the ones with lower topological invariants that can simply um, <clears throat> um, fuse with each other. And so in here, this is nothing else but fusion of topological solitons that gives us higher degree topological solitons. We have observed this type of uh, topological structures not only for heliotrons that I just discussed with you, but also for two-dimensional skirmions, right? So in here you can see uh, the uh, different types of skirmion bags that we introduced earlier this year, uh, and those also can have topological degrees, in this case skirmion numbers, um, uh, that uh, can be any integer, essentially, um, uh, that you would wish. Uh, but I what I would like to discuss with you next is a little bit of uh, dynamics and active matter type of behavior that all of these different types of solitons can exhibit. So I understand how much time we have? Oh, okay. Um, well, um, so I'll have to rush very quickly through this. Um, <coughs> So again, um, this is very simple geometry where uh, all we are doing is applying a modulated electric field, and when we have such spatially localized structures, um, uh, as the voltage is modulated, uh, they start moving back and forth, as you can see depicted in here. And this happens because of non-reciprocal nature of the field uh, configuration change as you um, are turning voltage on and off, right? And because of that, there is net translation of such topological solitons, um, which can um, then give different types of emergent behavior when we have many such soliton particles. And then here you can see what happens um, as um, they start elastically interacting with each other um, <clears throat> and uh, um, uh, developing uh, coherent motions like in schools of fish um, or in herds of animals. Um, <clears throat> So moreover, with time, we can see that the polar order parameters that are describing orientations of the vectors connecting the south and north pole pre-images are developing high degrees of polar order, and also velocity order parameters increase quite dramatically, um, in both cases approaching unity in a few seconds after um, we apply electric field. But because these topological solitons are embedded within a liquid crystal medium, uh, as we are changing voltage, they also interact with each other like particles would, and these interactions can be highly reconfigured. So as we are changing voltage, um, we can switch those interactions from repulsive to attractive, and when we have the large schools of such skirmions, we can induce clustering and cohesion within the schools um, uh, in both forms of uh, linear chains and um, uh, the little isotropic clusters. So you can see in here that as we would probe the dynamics of such solitons out of equilibrium, uh, we can see giant number fluctuations, again, uh, reminiscent of many um, active matter systems behaviors uh, and different types of clustering, again, giant number fluctuations that they exhibit while moving in these coherently moving schools of topological solitons. So there is a very rich diagram of behavior um, that uh, in here is summarized in this other recent work. Um, as we are changing applied fields in a very 
a small range of voltages and frequencies, we can reconfigure this auto equilibrium behavior in quite dramatic way. Um, and so uh, just to, to kind of add a little bit more to it, um, <clears throat> I will skip a couple things, but um, <coughs> um, well, so, so as these topological solitons crystallize, um, <coughs> you can see them coherently moving um, in a single direction eventually, as you see depicted in here. And again, the only thing that my student is doing in this case is modulating applied field and these crystallites of topological solitons start coherently moving. So I thought the only way crystals could move would be like in Korean, North Korean army, like depicted in here, right? Um, but turns out there is something more interesting than that. Um, uh, and so as we would look at this motion, you can see that these solitons are very soft particles. They are being squeezed and stretched, and there are a lot of uh, grain boundaries and defects uh, showing very interesting dynamics as this happens. Um, moreover, as we would look at these particles in uh, a bright field microscopy video, like you, the one you can see in here, we see that they are moving effectively like dancing, right? So these uh, uh, solitons from one hexagon in the lattice to another position of that same hexagon in here uh, uh, are moving while undergoing a very complex, interesting trajectory, right? Um, as you just uh, uh, effectively dancing, as you uh, can appreciate from um, these time trajectories. And n that's not all, uh, because they're also rotating in a very interesting way, in a non-reciprocal non way, um, as you can see depicted in here. So with every modulation of voltage, they are turning to the left and then to the right. Um, <clears throat> uh, and so in a way, that resembles not North Korean army, but more Rio de Janeiro carnival. Um, and so with that, I would like to finish with a little summary. Um, <clears throat> so I, I hope I um, convinced you that uh, Hopfions, Skirmions, and Helinotons can behave as topologically protected particles. They exhibit um, emergent self-assembly and collective dynamics, mimicking colloids, atoms, and even um, active particles. They can also promise a lot of new interesting electro-optic and other applications. Um, <clears throat> and I believe that topology opens new opportunities for uh, fundamental science and applications of liquid crystals. And these are just very few examples, but I hope more will follow. Thank you. Absolutely. If you heat to high enough temperature that you destroy liquid crystal order altogether, they will go away too. Um, but uh, <coughs> yeah, no. So you know, a lot of things remain to be studied because as you will change temperature, pH is changing too. The effective size is changing. So just like with electric field you can produce a lot of reconfiguration if you wish, right? Um, but um, uh, the energetic barriers associated with destroying them are tens of thousands of K-Boltzmann T under these conditions, right? So it's not really e very easy to destroy them. You push them, you could see they were in very tightly packed crowds, they did not disappear, right? Uh, 
uh, well, yeah, so uh, case three, you mean just for like twist band pneumatic phase, yeah. Um, you, could, you could maybe expand the region of stability or shrink it, depends on, on conditions as well.